Um, so first, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. So unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, but I hope you can bear uh, one more online talk. Um, so I will be talking a little bit more on uh, kind of the fundamentals of uh, of consistency of and uh, how how the solutions behave. Uh, so I will starts with a, well, introducing the statistical inverse problem that I'm considering. And then I will consider the behavior of the solution in two type of uh, different uh, settings. So I'll first start with the Gaussian priors. So these are infinite dimensional Gaussian process priors. Um, and as a smaller uh, spoiler alert, um, the convergence rates we get there are not uh, optimal in the minimum sense. So I will then, after that, consider truncated Gaussian prior. So these are something that are a little bit more um, realistic also in a way that when you actually, uh, in practice, want to um, well solve the problem, you do need to use some type of truncation of, of your prior anyways. Um, so just to start with the problem, so I'll consider a heat equation with an extra cooling term. Um, so what, what's the kind of, what's our problem here is that I, I assume that I can make um, indirect measurements from the forward solution to this uh, heat uh, problem here. And what I want to discover is the red F. So the F is the, the unknown function here that I would like to discover. And notice here that I have a bounded uh, set O, and um, we have then some uh, times from zero to T, uh, which means that I'm considering uh, sort of a space-time cylinder. So I assume that the, the set O is fixed regardless of the time. And I'm given, so I assume that I know um, the G, which are uh, the boundary values for this problem, and u0, which are the initial values for my problem. And of course, if you think about it, so we have some boundary values, which are on the boundary of, of the set O, depending on the time. Um, and then we have uh, initial values u0. And of course, on, on the boundary where time goes to zero and the u0 goes to the boundary, uh, those two meet. So we do also need to assume that they meet there smoothly enough. So that obviously they need to have the same value on the boundary, but they also need to kind of uh, uh, come together in a smooth enough way. And now this, of course, the forward problem uh, is well studied. Uh, so if we assume that the, the boundary and the initial values are both positive and sufficiently regular, and by this I mean that they kind of meet smoothly enough. Um, and if I assume that the F is positive, uh, then we know that there is a unique positive solution, UF. And this UF, I have this kind of C21 notion here. It means that it has two space derivatives and one time derivative. So this is a, uh, well, it, it is a parabolic problem. So we have both space and uh, time. Um, well, so, so far I've only said that this solution exists. But we can also write it down uh, using something called feynman kac formula. And well, the first thing you can see here is that remember that what we were interested in recovering is the uh, function f, so the red function f here. And so you can see that uh, this is definitely not a linear inverse problem. Uh, the other interesting thing is, so this is written uh, using the Brownian motion which starts from the point X. So this is the point X that you want to approx you, you want to calculate your UF in. And of course, if you have a Brownian motion uh, in this space, then there's two uh, different things that can happen with respect to the time T that we are looking for the solution. Uh, the first thing is that if, well, the, the, the Brownian motion, it, it wanders in the space, and it either exits the space or it's still inside the space at the time t. And so you can see that there are two kind of a parts in the solution. So the first part, the first row, uh, this is kind of considers the parts that the t is larger than the exit time. So your Brownian motion is still inside the set. 
And in that case, uh, we use the U0. So the initial values give kind of this solution. Uh, and the second line um, uses the boundary values. And this is the part that is used if your uh, Brownian motion has exited this place. Um, and of course, then you take the value of where it exited and what time did it exit. And so we can see kind of nicely how this um, initial and the boundary value values um, affect the solution. Um, okay, so now we have considered the, the forward solution, the UF. We know that exists, we know how smooth it is, and we know at least one way how to write it down. Um, but we were interested in the inverse problem of recovering the F from the indirect measurements of the UF. Uh, so I'm going to write UF now as a function of F. Uh, so UF is a G of F. And well, since I make um, measurements, I can only have uh, some finite amount of these measurements. Uh, and this means also that you need to make those measurements in some points. And of course, I have again the space and time. And in this case, I assume that I randomly uh, just draw uniformly uh, from this space time cylinder. Uh, so you could do similar analysis also assuming that you just regularly kind of uh, uh, sample from both of those. Uh, but in, in this talk, I assume that I just uh, uniformly randomly draw from the space time cylinder. Uh, and of course, this is an inverse problem. We always have some amount of noise. And in this case, I assume that I have Gaussian white noise uh, affecting the measurements. Um, so I'm sure this is something you have seen similar, well, several times uh, so far, but so I'm gonna use the Bayesian approach uh, to solve this inverse problem, but I'm always gonna keep somehow in the back of my mind that there is this true F0 that I am interested in recovering. Um, so if we start from this, what we assume is that we have this data Y and it comes from some um, true unknown probability distribution that is parameterized by the F0. Um, now, I can't, I don't know what that F0 is, so I don't know this probability distribution. So I'll put a prior measure on the F and I then consider the probability distributions for the, the measurement uh, given a fixed F. And this fixed F is now drawn uh, from this prior. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to use the Bayes term uh, to update um, the prior distribution to a posterior distribution. And of course, now the solution is the full posterior distribution, but what we quite often do is we consider, for example, the conditional mean or, or the map estimator. So, um, but you do get more information. You get this whole posterior distribution. So you might want to use some of it, for example, um, for uncertainty quantification, considering, for example, the credible sets. Um, so after we have a solution, of course, the natural question is, does it make any sense? Is this a good solution? And well, the, the natural first step would be consider the, the convergence of the point estimators to the true F0. Now, this is something you would do also if you do recursion. There you just, um, you consider how your recursion solution converges to the true unknown. Uh, but I'm doing Bayesian inverse problems, so I do have the whole posterior distribution. So I want to consider something a little bit more. Um, so I want to consider the contraction of the posterior distribution around the true unknown. So you have some posterior distribution, and you would assume that the more and more data you get, or the smaller and smaller your, your noise uh, amplitude goes, you would assume that this posterior distribution contracts around the truth. Um, so if we can show this, then usually uh, the convergence of a point estimator, for example, the conditional mean, uh, follow automatically from this. So we don't need to study those two separately. Um, other thing is, of course, we can consider the contraction rate. We want to show that there is some rate that it at least contracts around the truth, which is maybe the first thing that we want. But of course, we would then also want to consider if this is a, if, if this is a good rate in some sense. And one way, uh, which is usually used uh, measuring this type of thing, is the minimum rate. 
So what this means is that you take the worst possible true F that can come from this set that you consider, and then you consider what would be uh, the speed that the best possible estimator could give you. And notice here that the, when I say the best possible estimator, I really mean that. So any, any estimator coming from the data, how well can it estimate the truth? So this is not uh, the best Bayesian estimator or, or best uh, even recurrence estimator. It, it is generally the best estimator that is created from the data. What is the best speed you can get? but for the worst possible F. Now, after this, we can go even further. So because uh, this only gives you the speed, but of course, one could also consider how does uh, the, the asymptotic distribution look? Because when you have just the speed, it does not yet give you um, the coefficients. So you don't yet know actually uh, the exact uh, exact covariance operator. And that would be one step further. And if you can actually uh, show that this, this distribution converges to some well-defined usually portion distribution, uh, then you can also actually use your credible sets and know that when you have enough data, they are quite close to the frequent, frequent disconfidence regions. Uh, so that actually gives you very good uh, uncertainty quantification kind of limits. Um, so the question that I'm considering here is that, is the Bayesian solution uh, statistically consistent? So do we have that when, when the data is generated from some true F0, then does the posterior mass concentrate around this F0? And also I'm interested if the speed that it does this is uh, minimax optimal. Uh, so this type of Problems have been considered a lot for um, linear inverse problems. So with the linear inverse problems, you can show, uh, you can cover quite large sets uh, in a one go, whereas, well, <laughs> as general with the nonlinear inverse problems, basically you need to go a little bit problem by problem. So there are some previous results. Uh, so as you can see here, most of these are from the last um, couple of years. Um, so I will be talking about the first paper there, or the first one in the list. Um, uh, I, I do use uh, some results from the paper by Matteo Giordani and Rick and Nicole, so the second last here, uh, where they also show that if you can show for the your nonlinear uh, operator certain kind of uh, limits, and I will later on talk about what kind of uh, things we need, uh, then we can say something a bit more in more general. Uh, another interesting paper that I'd like to put on is the, the second in the list so by Richard Nickel and, and Gabriel Patanine, where they actually consider a relatively simple problem, so like an elliptic uh, inverse problem, divergence form, and they can show that something called Ber Bernstein for Mises theorems are not necessarily true, even for that type of simple problems. And what this means is that it can happen that your Bayesian credible sets actually are not very close to your frequent dense confidence regions, which means that the, when you consider nonlinear inverse problems, the meaning of uncertainty quantification can be actually quite funny and tricky. But I, I don't go to the Bernstein for Mises theorems that far this time. So I, I stick uh, to the kind of second step on the contraction uh, results. So we will then move to the Gaussian priors. So this is now the first step. So this is the, the infinite dimensional kind of uh, limits, which we generally would want to work well, because this provides, of course, that then that your uh, truncations will also definitely work well. Um, so for this, I first need to define the set that I'm interested in recovering the functions f from. Uh, so my main assumptions here are that f is in some Sobolev space h alpha, so it has certain amount of weak derivatives, uh, and it's bounded away from zero. Uh, on top of that, I have a couple of uh, assumptions for the boundary behavior. So these are mainly for making the uh, calculations uh, kind of simpler. So you could have any type of fixed function on the boundary, but in this case, I just fix it to be one. Um, as I said, it could be some other function, but I definitely don't have a reason to believe that my function f, so the, the, the 
uh, extra kind of a conduction term in the heat equation would be zero on the boundary. Uh, this is a little bit problem because I would like to use the Gaussian process priors, but these are naturally supported on a compactly supported spaces H alpha. So I can't directly use my uh, Gaussian process priors for the F. Uh, well, thankfully, there is a solution, uh, which is that we can use regular link functions. So this means uh, we want to take a link function, which is a, bi a bijective reparameterization of the F uh, using some capital F. And why is this nice? Well, we can show that now instead of considering this little F, which we can then nicely get directly from the capital F, um, if we use this capital F uh, instead, then we can write the, the set of functions uh, F alpha using just capital F that come from a, a solar space with smoothness alpha, which are now compactly supported. And I'm now also gonna talk uh, about this like a curly G instead of the original G, but this is just original G uh, with working with this reparameterization and then using the capital F. So basically this is exactly the same as before, I'm just rewriting my little f uh, using this uh, link function and the capital F. Um, so we wanted to use the Bayesian approach, uh, and what this means is that, so I now model my capital F, so this reparameterization of the original F, by some uh, Gaussian probability measure, uh, where I can fix uh, the camera Martin space or the, the reproducing corner Hilbert space. Uh, we can then use the Bayes theorem and write the posture for any set given uh, the measurements. Notice that I now have, I say that I, my measurements are the actual measurement yn, but I also need to consider the z, which was uh, the x and t, so the draw from the space and time where I make this measurement y. And here we can, I just note that the now the joint log-like load function is just, because this is Gaussian, uh, we, we assumed white noise, this is just the squared uh, difference between the measurement and the g of f. And then a little bit hand wavily, we can write the, the posture distribution now as a combination of using this uh, joint log likelihood function and then uh, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space norm of the F. And of course, here, if you take now the minus logarithm of this, you will just get a regularized um, problem or regularization problem. So basically, what, what we do here also uh, follow, you, you can say that the, what we use here follows also then for these regularization problems. Um, so I didn't actually in the previous slide yet exactly define what my prior is. So how we create the prior is, is that I say that, well, the prior draws take values in C beta, so they have at least, and I have the beta had to be greater than two. Uh, and this comes from the fact that I assumed that the U, so the, the forward operator, forward solution U has at least two uh, space derivatives. Um, why is this? Well, for the F that we consider, it actually, it's only a function of X, so it's not the function of T, so I don't actually need to consider the time derivatives of the UF. So I just assume that my prior draws uh, have at least two derivatives. And then we consider also that this Gaussian prior has a uh, reproducing corner Hilbert space, which is now a subset, so it can be embedded into the H alpha, and alpha here needs to be greater than B plus dimension over two. So this is a very general class of the priors, which are constant, which kind of covers many of the usually used uh, priors. Uh, but the important part here is that I need to rescale this uh, prior depending on the amount of data that I have. So of course here, what we see is that the more and more data you have, the less and less regularization or the kind of, a, um, well, less and less regularization you'd assume that you need. 
Um, so all of this, so if we look at the prior here, I created the prior for the capital F. But of course, what I generally want to consider is the original F, so the, the function that we were interested in. And for this, we will use this prior, but we'll just use the push forward of this using the link function. Um, so this is just, uh, we want to consider then the law of the push forward uh, of the capital F for the F. So uh, nothing special happens there. Now, if we then consider this, uh, then we can indeed show that the posture distribution contracts around the true unknown F0 with a certain speed. Um, so this speed we can see here. So we, you, here you can see that we have uh, on the blue one that we have dependence on the alpha. So this is the Cameron Martin space of the prior. And then I'm putting it on the power, which depends on the beta which were uh, the smoothness of the, the prior draws. So I have two types of smoothness there, and it will turn out that this is uh, the kind of the problem why we don't get here uh, minimax optimality. Uh, so if we look at a little bit uh, closer what happens in, in the proof, this kind of a cookbook on what you generally need to prove this type of results, is that the first thing you need is a forward estimator. Sorry, forward estimate. So what this means is that if you have function f1 and f2 that in some sense are close to each other, then it means that also the U f g of f1 and g of f2 should be close to each other. And here again, uh, when I say in some sense, I'm considering the difference between f1 and f2 in the dual of h2. And again, this comes from the fact that I need two uh, space derivatives. And I want to consider uh, how close the g of f1 and g of f2 are in L2. Um, so using this forward estimate, we can then show that actually, if we consider the posture distribution um, of the f, then all of the mass or most of the mass concentrate in some balls in C beta. So notice I'm looking for a, for a true unknown F0, which is in the Cameron Martin space H alpha, but most of the posture distribution is concentrating in some sets in the C beta, which is a rougher space. Uh, the other kind of ingredient uh, that is needed since this is an inverse problem uh, are the stability estimates. So this means that now, if g of f is close to the g of f0, then my f and f0 also need to be close in some sense. And again, I want my f and f0 f to be close to each other in L2. So I need to consider uh, how close the g f and f0 are in H21. So this is now a subtle of space where we have uh, two weak derivatives in the space and one weak derivative in time. So these are the kind of uh, uh, general ingredients that are needed to prove this type of uh, problems uh, when you consider a nonlinear operator. Uh, so then um, from, uh, as I said before, so from the, from the contraction, we can generally get the convergence also for the posterior mean. So here we just have the same as before. So we have, a, this is exactly the same speed as I showed you before, but now just kind of written open. And again, you can see that we have here um, the smoothness beta, which is the, the kind of the draw, uh, smoothness of the prior draws and then alpha, which is the smoothness of the camera Martin space. Uh, so this is just to show that from the, the contraction rates, we can get also convergence uh, results for, for the uh, conditional mean estimate. But now we have calculated um, the contraction speed or the, the coverage speed uh, for, for example, is in, is in this case, the conditional mean. But the question was that, is this a good rate? So is this in some sense optimal or can we actually do better? 
And in this case, uh, we can actually calculate the minimax rates. Uh, so the minimax rates uh, for this problem, and again, I remind you that these are lower bound estimates uh, for estimating the F using any estimator. So not just the uh, Bayesian estimator go using Gaussian priors or anything like this. So this is, uh, you're looking for the best estimator using the data. And as you can see, uh, this lower bound here is different than if we consider this upper bound here. So there is genuinely a difference between the two. Uh, but here, if you know, if, if I could, instead of using this separate alpha and beta, if I could replace my alpha by beta, sorry, the other way around. So if I <laughs> replace my beta by alpha, then I would get exactly this. So here we have, we have alpha plus two, and here we have beta plus two. So this would disappear. And if beta is alpha, this would be exactly what we have here. Uh, so it seems that there is something funny happening when I use the Gaussian process priors. So this, this idea that I have my uh, prior draws coming from this uh, rough space has an effect on, on the result. Um, so as I said, uh, the, the contraction rates I showed, they are not optimal compared to the, the minimax rate. Uh, since for the optimality, I would need to have the power alpha divided by two plus alpha, not with betas. Uh, so I would like to replace the betas by alpha, but I in, in this case, I can't do this because I assume that the alpha has to be greater than the beta plus dimension over two, because it is a camera modern space. So it is genuinely smoother um, for, for a Gaussian prior than the set where I draw my um, prior draws. Uh, so the thing is that what I'm interested in recovering is an F0, which is in this camera Martin space. And the camera Martin space is embedded in the H alpha. Uh, but the posterior mass, as showed in the previous slide, is concentrated on C pizza balls. Uh, so there is a difference between um, what I'm trying to estimate and where the kind of the posterior draws come from or where most of the mass of the posterior is concentrated on. And what I'm going to next show is that how we can overcome this problem by using uh, truncated Gaussian process priors. Uh, so this means that instead of considering this full infinite dimensional Gaussian prior, I'm, I'm now gonna truncate them on certain levels depending on the amount of data. And this is of course also a very realistic situation because if you want to actually use Gaussian priors to solve this problem, you would anyway need to use uh, some kind of a truncated form. Um, so, I'm gonna, how I'm gonna create these truncated Gaussian process priors is using uh, something called Karun and Love expansion. Um, I'm going to use as the basis, um, Dobbesi wavelets. And uh, I need to do one extra assumption here compared to the, what I did before. And this is that instead of my F0 being compactly supported uh, in the O, I now assume that there is some compact K, which is a subset of the O, uh, and my F0 is, is supported inside this fixed K. So this is just so that the, you can get the uniform uh, uh, solution for this thing. Um, so in the first line, I say that I, I use Dobbesi wavelets for the RD, but now I have a bounded set O. So of course I don't, really need to consider those wavelets that do not have any support inside the K. So I can only consider those wavelets uh, that have any contact with the set K that I'm interested in. Uh, and then I will use these um, wavelets to create, let's say, the, 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 post, uh, the prior draws. But of course, if, if I consider all of the wavelets that have any contact so support, at least partly in the K, it means that they will, I will also have wavelets that have part of the, the support outside the K. 
So I will then need to use the cutoff function so that when, when I create the um, prior draws using all of those wavelets um, so that the, the support of this new function is still inside though. So to write this a little bit more mathematically, um, I, I create my truncated uh, Gaussian uh, priors uh, using a sum where now my coefficients are just drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. Uh, I use uh, those wavelets, wavelets that has, have any part of their support inside the K. So I don't need to consider all of the, the wavelets because some of them are not in any connection. Uh, and then I need to scale this thing in a way that this actually sums up. Uh, but since some of the wavelets do have also support outside the set O, I need to then use a cutoff function so that now that the, the uh, new functions are really inside the original set O, and then I consider the law of this thing as my new uh, base prior. I notice here that this is genuinely a um, finite sum because I only sum over those wavelets that are in contact with the sets. Uh, and because wavelets are very, well, they are uh, localized, there are only finite amount of uh, wavelets that actually do have contact with the set K. And then I also have a some upper bound J, which is the, the truncation point. And this truncation point is chosen uh, to depend on the amount of data. So the more and more data you have, the, the larger and larger you make the sum so that you're kind of taking finer and finer details into account. Now, using these, we, we have a centered Gaussian prior, which has the support, which is just this in the span of the, the wavelets uh, that have contact with the K. So these are kind of a nicer, nice finite dimensional uh, subspaces. And what I do with this truncated prior is exactly the same as, as before with the Gaussian prior. So now I scale it exactly the same way as before. So again, of course, uh, the more and more data you have, the less and less regularization you think that you would need. So this is, this is exactly the scaling here. And so using this truncated prior and rescaled prior, uh, we can actually show that if we now assume that the, the true unknown is in the subular space H alpha, uh, but now so that it's supported in the K, uh, then we can show that the contraction actually happens around the true unknown F zero, but now with the minimax uh, contraction rate. Uh, so this comes from the fact that if we look at the proof for this one, well, using uh, truncated Gaussian priors, uh, then we can actually show that the posterior mass now concentrates into H alpha. So it concentrates into the same space as where the F F0 that I am interested in recovering actually is. So it, with the continuous Gaussian, ones, Gaussian process priors, the mass concentrated in the C beta, which was the, the rougher space. Um, so then just to sum up, uh, we considered a nonlinear inverse problem. So a parabolic inverse problem of recovering uh, the uh, absorption term F in the heat equation. Um, we can actually show the minimax low, lower bound uh, for the rate of estimating the F in this problem. Um, one thing that I maybe didn't mention so well in previous is that if we would consider just the, the kind of the forward problem of recovering the G F zero, so basically the U, so the forward solution, uh, then we get the minimax optimal rate. But if we are interested in covering the F zero, so the, the, if you are interested in the inverse problem, then using the Gaussian process prior, we do not gain the optimal rate. Um, but of course, if you take uh, beta to be very large, so if you use smoother and smoother uh, uh, 
uh, prior, so if you assume that you have very, very smooth function that you want to recover, uh, then you will get closer and closer uh, to the optimal rate. But of course, it's not usually a very interesting case because you do assume that your function is not infinitely smooth. Uh, so the problem when using the Gaussian process priors was that uh, we are interested in re recovering F0 with the certain amount of smoothness. So it, it, the F0 being in um, H alpha, so having alpha weak derivatives, but the posterior mass concentrates in C beta, which was a rougher space, a larger space. So there is kind of a mismatch between the two. But this problem uh, can be cured by considering truncated Gaussian priors. So there, uh, if the truncation case is, is chosen correctly, we can actually show that using those truncated Gaussian priors, we can uh, achieve the minimax optimal convergence. And that was uh, everything for me. So thank you.